There's one more type of motion planning that I'd like to show you, and it requires a grid for it to work. The function is known as motion planning grid, and it's based on an algorithm called A star, written like this. I'm not going to go into how the algorithm actually works, but basically it uses a grid and tries to figure out the shortest path from one point on the grid to another point on the grid. Let me just run the game and show you what I've got so far so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so it's a little confusing. Um, I'm the white player up here, and these are all enemies, and they're all using motion planning, and they're using the grid version of it. These are the paths that are being generated for each enemy, and they're trying to find the shortest distance to me um, using a grid. So each point along the grid is the center of this grid, which I'll turn on for you so you can see it. But uh, first, let me just show you that they update. So here they are constantly updating their paths, trying to find their way around objects they're not supposed to collide with, which would be the walls. I can go into the walls, so I'm safe here. And uh, when they hit the end of the path, they just go the other direction. Okay, let's look at what that is inside the object. Okay, so in the step event of my object enemy, I've got my motion planning for grid, and there's a lot to cover with this particular one. Um, the first and most important part is creating the grid that will be used for the motion planning. So the function is MP grid create. This has to be stored inside some sort of variable to be referenced later by all of the other functions for uh, motion planning grid. Now this function creates a motion planning grid for the motion planning functions, as I just said, and these are the arguments inside the function. Uh, you want to define the left and top corner of where the grid will start. Uh, so I'm starting it at 0, 0 in the room, that's going to be the very top left corner of the room. And then you have to set up the horizontal cells and the vertical cells. Uh, that means uh, how many cells there are horizontally uh, from the starting point and vertically down from the starting point, um, I'm using something called cell size. This is in the create event of this object and it is 32. Uh, the reason I chose that number is it's based on the room size. My room is 640 by 640 and um, a common divisor or common factor of these numbers uh, is 32. I could use 16 or 64, a few other numbers actually. Um, but I'll get into how the number is important a bit later. Uh, point is, it divides evenly. So 640 divide, uh, divided by 32 is uh, a whole integer. And if we hop back into this, I'm taking the total room width, dividing it by that 32, doing the same for the height. And then I'm setting the actual size of each cell. I'm going to use cell size again. So I've got... Uh, a bunch of cells going across the screen, down the screen, and they're all going to be 32 uh, in size, 32 pixels. Um, the most important thing I'll have to show you is in a draw event, I've got a whole bunch, but they're all commented out right now, is drawing the actual grid. So let's turn that off. So this is motion planning grid draw, and then you just tell it, well, which grid do you want to draw? Well, I only created one and it's called grid. This will actually draw the grid to the screen so we can see what's going on uh, kind of under the hood. I had to set the alpha to something lower because every single enemy is drawing this. That's really inefficient, but I'm just doing it for simplicity's sake on my end. Then I'm just going to return the alpha back to 1. So here's what that looks like with the grid turned on. Okay, now that I have the grid turned on, um, I'm putting myself in the wall over here. You can see that uh, starting at the top left corner of the room, um, so many cells uh, across my room and down my room um, are segmented um, by the number 32. So 640 divided by 32 and 640 in height divided by 32 uh, creates how many segments there are going to be uh, or cells or nodes. And I created the size as being cell size by cell size, which is 32 by 32. So everything chops up very nicely, very evenly based on my room width and room height. Now, if you look at the paths that are being generated by these enemies, um, you'll notice that they're going to the center points of each cell and trying to make their way to me. This is how the motion planning works. This is how A star works. It goes through a grid finding the shortest distance to a destination. Um, one small issue with that, of course, is it's based on the uh, origin point of each instance, so they don't look like they're colliding properly with the wall. They actually go into the wall a bit, and that's because they're trying to get their origin point to this point. 
There are some ways around that. I'm not going to cover that here. This is just for the motion planning grid function. Um, now, the green area is areas that are okay. They are traversable. And the red areas are the obstacles, things that should be avoided. Now, one thing I did was I offset these two blocks to show you something important later. You'll notice that the red actually goes outside of the area of these blocks. Now I just want to show you what would happen if you change the cell size for the grid. We have it at 32. If we drop it to 8, it'll be more precise but require more computational power. So you see all of the enemies chasing me here have more options, more cells to calculate, uh, but they also seem to jitter around wildly, which probably isn't what you want. And there's a drop in frame rate because it requires uh, more computational power for such a small grid. And you know what? They're, these cell sizes are smaller than my actual sprites. My sprites are 32, so there's no reason to have it so small. Same problem if I made it 64. It's not the size of my sprite, so it's not really efficient to do this. The blocks are a lot bigger, their paths are going to look a lot wider, uh, they don't jitter around as much, but you always want to optimize what you're doing, and since my sprites fit into 32, that's why I'll be using 32 for my uh, cell size. Now we've got um, this section, Motion Planning Grid Add Instances. This is where you would add anything that is a uh, forbidden square or forbidden node or, or, or cell. This is where you can't go, where these uh, object enemies can't go. Marks all cells that an instance of the indicated object overlaps as being forbidden. Now the important part here is overlaps. Um, as you saw with those walls, I put them at uh, an uneven number there, uh, but they were overlapping uh, cells, um, not fully, only partially, so because they were even one pixel into that cell, they were forbidden. And the reason for that is I used motion planning grid, add instances. Uh, it says, okay, which grid do you want to add to? Add the ID, I'm using grid, I want it to add to this one. Then you want to add your instance or object. Um, I'm going to use the object wall, that's this. doesn't really do anything, it just lives in the room as an object, just so I can set it here so I can tell the enemy to avoid it. And then whether or not to be precise. This is the important part. This is what I was talking about with the overlap. I have it set to false. What that means is as long as a single pixel enters one of the cells, it becomes a forbidden cell. Now, maybe you don't want that. Maybe you want something else. To show you an example of this, I've created a sprite, which is a cross pattern. And the most important thing to understand about this is I've set it to precise collision checking. Um, so it's perfectly creating a, a bounding box within the pixels. Um, if I have this set to false, which means it's not reading that precision, it's not reading it as precise, and I run the grid, you'll see that it's actually taking up all nine squares around it. Even though I've set it to precise, these are becoming forbidden as if there's a bounding box drawn around it. And if that's not what you want, if you're checking for something that is a precise bounding box for your sprite, you do have to set precise to true. And then when you run it, you'll notice that these boxes are now freed up, these, these cells. Uh, that's because it's now reading the precise bounding box and not the uh, bounding box that would take up all edges of the sprite. So this is just something to understand um, about the instances you can add to create um, forbidden cells. Now we're not going to bother with that, we're just going to use our wall, and since our wall is one big box, it really doesn't matter. Uh, if we're using precision uh, or not. Now before I get into this other stuff right in the middle here, uh, the part that matters is right at the bottom. This is what's making the enemies actually move and try to get to my player. And I've used a conditional statement here, if, and actually this should have parentheses around it, um, but here we go, if, uh, motion planning grid path, and inside this function, it wants to know the ID again, so we're going to use grid, it's our only one. Then the path. Now, for this, I'm just starting an empty path called my path. It's probably the best way to do it because it's going to just overwrite any path you created through the resource tree here. So when I initialize my 
enemies here in their create event. I'm just creating a path called my path using the path add function. There are no points in this path. It's just a dummy path so that the uh, motion planning grid can add a path to it. So as long as you've set that up, you can use it here by calling it, and it's going to plot the points uh, by getting a starting position, which I've put my X and my Y, or perhaps the enemy's X and Y, and where it's going, which is the goal X and Y. Um, I have that in the end step event, um, right here, object player .x, object player .y. These are my goal X and Y, it's where I'm trying to go. The only reason I put it in the end step is so that it updates after the step event. Um, and this is so that the player gets to move one more step before I update. It's not always necessary. You could just put in object player dot x, object player dot y here. That might work just fine for you. I'm just saying the only reason I'm doing it is so it completes its step before I check again. Uh, and then the last one is allowing diagonals. Um, we can allow diagonals, and you'll see them move diagonally between cells, obviously. Just like this, there's a diagonal path here. Um, for some reason, if you don't want that in your game, you can set that to false or zero. So as you can see, now they can't move diagonally. Um, normally this one would move like this because it's uh, more efficient for him to do that, but he can't, so he has to go up and then over. Now you'll notice there are these little loops or diagonals here. That's just so they can get to their closest uh, center point on the grid before getting the same same thing here when they try to get to me they do a little bit of a diagonal because they're trying to get to something that's off of the grid um, now that doesn't really look too good for me I would prefer it to be diagonal looks a little smarter looks great um, anyway as long as this is true um, we get to start our path uh, which path do we start my path that's the one we initialized earlier um, at what speed I'm using step size this is a variable I set up in the create event uh, right here four so it's gonna move four pixels per step towards its goal and then uh, what does it do when it gets to the end of the path you notice when they couldn't find me they reversed that's because I set path action as reverse. I could set that to stop or magically jump back to the starting position again or, or whatever. Whatever works best for your game, there are actions. Watch my path video to see different ways to set up paths. And then uh, absolute, this is whether or not the uh, path should be started from where you are, where this calling instance is, um, or whether the instance should jump to wherever the path starts. This path actually has no points to begin with, but this is it. This is how to set up your path. Um, and really there's not much going on here. I'm just saying, hey, which cells should be forbidden? And now do your smart path. The other interesting things you can do with it is instead of adding instances, define your own areas of forbidden cells. For that, I've got this, marks the indicated cell as being forbidden to the pathfinding functions. So you're just adding a cell. Uh, once again, where do you add it? Grid. And then which cell? This is done by cell number. I've chosen uh, 12 and 3. And um, if we just run the game, we should actually see that appear in the 12th, third cell. There we go. So it starts at zero up here. It will go up to the 12th cell and then down to the third cell. And now I've marked that as being forbidden. So they'll actually have to go around it. As you can see, they're trying to plan a path around this spot. Even though it has nothing to do with any of the instances in the game, I just said, okay, that cell is off limits. So you can add a whole bunch of them yourself. You can cycle through them with a for loop or something to that end. Uh, other ways you can do it, if you want to add a whole region, you can do it with a rectangle. This marks all cells that overlap the indicated rectangle as being forbidden. Similar to how the bounding box around the cross was invisible, but marking forbidden cells. This way you can make your own rectangle. Uh, we're going to put it to grid. Uh, it wants the top left coordinate of the rectangle on the bottom right. I'm just using my own set up here. So it's going to start at 100 and 110 going to 340 and 500. So you can see that. I've actually set that up to draw it. So let's uh, see what that looks like inside the game. Now you can see that I'm drawing this rectangle here. Now I can enter it. That's fine for me. Uh, but these three guys are already inside it, so they can't possibly find a path to me. These two guys actually can. So if I pop out, oh, look at that update. Okay, so they're going to try to get here, and if they can't, they're going to 
reverse once they figure out they can't. Oh, okay. So the cool thing is you can see the path update wherever I go and pop out that side. But we've defined an entire region where the enemy can't go. This might be important for your game. This might be a safe zone or, or whatever in your game. Quick way to add a whole bunch of cells. Now, if we check out the next functions, uh, we, we can actually get the um, what's going on in a cell. This returns whether a cell is occupied or not, uh, whether it's forbidden or not. Now, to call it later, I'm going to store it in something called cell occupied, and it's MP grid get cell. And I'm going to get the 15th X cell, the uh, horizontal cell, and the 18th vertical cell. And I want to know, uh, is this a forbidden cell or not? Now we need to draw a few things to the screen so we can see what's going on. Um, we want to draw the Occupy. So in this little draw event here, I've got draw text just above uh, each of the enemies. I'm just going to draw the string of cell occupied. Um, this is a zero or a negative one, and we're going to draw a circle as to where it is. So I'm just doing some math here. Uh, 32 is the cell size. I'm just going to get the 15th and the 18th, and then I'm going to move it back by 16 just so it lies in the middle of the cell. Uh, so this is what it'll look like. We're going to have a black dot, or white dot in this case, down here. This is cell 15 and 18, and uh, it is indeed occupied. This is forbidden, so it's going to return a negative 1. So they see it that way, they're like, oh, I can't go there. So if you do need to know the status of a cell, uh, we can do it that way. Uh, another function we can use inside of here is a whole set of clearing. We've got three of them, three ways we can clear cells. Um, not much to show here, it's just the same way as adding a cell, but instead of making it forbidden, which these are doing, we're going to make them free, clear them up. Uh, this one is clear cell. This is setting a very specific cell. Uh, this one I have four and four, and we should also only have that one running, so it's the only one that comes up. But when we run it, we should be clearing uh, cell 4x4, four four, which is, lies right there. So as you can see, even though I ran this rectangular portion uh, earlier in the code, the next thing that will follow is clearing a portion of it. So same thing will work for uh, clearing all of it. This would actually be uh, redundant unless you have switches that turn it on and off. This clears the entire grid. Everything is totally clear and free. They can find me anywhere, no matter what. This is useful if you said, like, if something's happening, clear everywhere, and if not happening, go back to normal. And you can also do that with a rectangle the same way I was creating an area. I can free an area. Very, very simple stuff. Now, the most important thing to understand about motion planning grid is that this will create a buffer in memory. So when I did the creation portion right here, uh, MP grid create, this stored a this whatever this is that's being stored inside grid, all of the behind the scenes code that GameMaker is doing lies in memory somewhere. So if you're no longer using this grid system, uh, make sure you release it from memory. So I've got it at room N. I'm going to delete my memory buffers. I'm going to delete my path. That also lies in memory. But I'm also going to destroy my grid. Make sure to do that. Right here we can say it says destroys the indicated MP grid and frees up its memory. Simple stuff. I also did that if uh, uh, the enemy is destroyed. If the enemy is destroyed, also delete my path and the grid. And that's really all there is to it. This video, along with the basic motion planning, um, will give you a an idea of how to do some simple pathing through uh, some simple AI. And what you'll notice is that not all of these work. Each one has its own uh, strengths and weaknesses. You just find the one that works best for your game. This one uh, maybe didn't look the best for the way collisions work. You have to write some more code that way. Um, maybe just linear is what you need. Or um, maybe potential, motion planning potential is what you need. Either way, you can do a combination of them or find the one that works best for your game. But hopefully now you understand how to do some motion planning in your upcoming games.